it's good to be here. No. It's good to be here. No, it's good to be here. You know what? I saw Steve Martin, a comedian, do that. I thought it was pretty funny. But you just think I'm crazy, don't you? <laughs> you know I'm crazy. You're familiar with me, and that's okay. Crazy is fun. It really is good to be here. I always love coming to CCF Eastwood. It's really a treat. Thank you for that announcement about the books. I'll pay you later. <laughs> um, it really is a fun thing, and I'm glad to sign them. It really makes my self-esteem go high when I get to do that. I feel important. So anyway, I hope those are a blessing um, to you and to some kids as well. I'm going to introduce one of the guests that I've been hosting. I've got about 13 uh, people from the uni uh, Colorado Christian University in Denver, Colorado, and one of them, his name is Justin, is going to come up and give a little testimony. So would you wel welcome Justin? Justin up here, if I could find a microphone for him, perfect, ah, here he comes, he's very handsome, he's very single, a word to the wise is sufficient. Thank you, uh, Pastor Vince, for that interesting introduction. Um, so uh, my name is Justin, um, like Pastor Vince said, I'm from Colorado with my people, give a little wave, there we are, hello, hi. <laughs> Um, yeah, and I'm just going to share for a couple of minutes with you guys uh, just what the Lord has done in my life and what he's been doing in my life and just uh, how it's been affecting me. Um, is that cool with you guys? We can, we can have a little conversation here. That's okay. Uh, so I grew up in a Christian home. I had Christian parents, um, wonderful family, love them to death. Um, and so I basically was raised in the church um, and... Uh, because of this, I really knew a lot about the attributes of God, but I didn't personally know him very well. Um, so uh, basically, uh, when I became a Christian uh, and I accepted Jesus for the first time, I was about 10 years old. Um, and it was awesome and it was amazing and it was great, but uh, my life didn't really change. Um, and it was more of a surface change rather than a behavioral change. Um, and I think this was a, not just a personal, but more of a, like a collective uh, situation we deal with as Christians, um, where we accept Jesus, but we still have this, this sin that we still have to deal with. Um, and then anyway, we moved to Colorado the year after that, um, and in Colorado we found a church and it was great, and we loved it, and a few months into the church, um, we had a shooting at the church, and we had two girls die. Um, and that was heavy for our church. It took a toll, and it was, it was taxing. Um, and for me personally, I felt like I really couldn't trust the Lord, um, because if he couldn't keep me safe in the church where he created us to be, how could I, how could I trust him outside of these walls? So I really struggled with that. Um, and I didn't understand God. I didn't understand what he was doing. And as I was growing up and going into middle school and high school, I really struggled to understand uh, where he was and why he was doing what he was doing. Because I didn't think he was faithful to me. And I didn't think he was loving to me. Um, and so I, I really uh, didn't have a lot of friends growing up. I really struggled with um, meeting people and, and getting into uh, groups. Um, and I was really shy. Um, and I really felt undesired because of that, and I started to believe the lies the enemy was telling me, that I wasn't loved, and that I wasn't worthy, and that I wasn't worth it. Um, and so this combination of uh, still sinning and like being lonely really took its toll on me, and I really uh, pulled away from God. And I was still going to church every Sunday with my family and, and just fading away from the Lord. It was, it was a dark time. Um, and then, uh, as I was growing up uh, in high school, one day I was sitting in the back of this youth service um, in a room about this size, uh, and I was I was worshiping God, and I felt I felt so hypocritical because I didn't I didn't want to be at church, and I wanted to love God, but I didn't even like myself, and so I really I just didn't understand um, why God would let me feel this way. And, and he doesn't want us to feel this way. You know, like, 
God marked me with his love that day, and he marked me with his identity that day. And I no longer was ashamed of who I was, and I no longer was afraid of who I was. And I think uh, as Christians, we become um, so caught up in our own thoughts and our own uh, sinful maybe natures or desires that we forget how good God really is and how faithful God really is. And I definitely forgot that in my own life. Um, and I think um, this process where I, where I start to become this new creation, this uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 idea, uh, where if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation and the old has passed away. And I really, I really had a hard time adjusting to this new creation and this old passing away because I still had old behavior habits that I wasn't that I didn't like and that I didn't want because I know the Lord loves me and I know he wants the best for me, but like I couldn't be obedient to him. And so um, I really had to learn uh, to choose to believe the gospel and the power that Jesus has um, because that is what changes people's lives and that's what changes people's behavior. It's that Jesus sent his son to die for us because he loves us and it's not because of our good deeds or our good works. It's because he desires to be with us. And I really grasped that idea of choosing to believe God for who he is. And I had to choose that daily. And I still have to make that decision, choosing to believe God for who he is and that he has good plans for me and that he loves me. Uh, and so my encouragement to you guys today is to just choose the Lord. Just choose his goodness and his faithfulness. Uh, choose to be obedient to him in the hard things and the easy things. Um, choose to love him when you don't feel like loving. Because our God loves us unconditionally and faithfully. Um, yeah, and he doesn't let us down. And he's not a God to just let us wander. Yeah, so I'm going to pray, uh, and then Pastor Vince will come back up. Uh, Lord, we just thank you for who you are, uh, and we thank you for uh, being in this place with us today. God, I pray uh, for these people. I pray that you would be um, glorified in this room, God, um, that we would be able to take you um, outside of these walls um, into the cities and into the communities and into the families and we'll be able to sh represent you well and show who you are well and I pray we'll be able to love people uh, like you love us um, and I just pray that you would mark us with your love and with your goodness and your faithfulness in Jesus name amen Thank you, Justin. Um, appreciate your sharing. And I hope your hearts are encouraged. Mine is. That was good, good words. Thank you. Heidi? Heidi's the leader of the group. I have two daughters. I want to talk to you after this, okay, about some of the guys in this group. Maybe we can make out some arrangement, you know. Uh, what do you think? Sound like a good idea? Anyway, just kidding. <laughs> I don't want to embarrass anybody. Yes, I do. <laughs> Um, how many of you had a hard time getting up this morning? Anybody? Okay, a few of you, okay. Um, a few weeks ago, I did not. And the reason was, uh, we stay in a guest house in Valley Golf, and right across the street, they crank up a market every morning about 5 a.m. And that's not a problem, I can sleep through that. But some stinker put a rooster right outside our gate. And he went off about 4 o'clock one morning, and I woke up, and I couldn't fall back asleep. But the really weird part of the story is I really thought this and envisioned this in my mind. I was imagining myself as Liam Neeson on the phone in the movie Taken, and I was talking to the rooster. I will find you. I will kill you. Now, I need to confess that and get that off my chest. Okay, that's not radical love, now is it? Uh, not rooster love either. But anyway, um, uh, isn't that crazy? Yeah, Vince, you're crazy. Um, I know it. I'm also going to be crazy and try to tell you a joke that has some Tagalog in it. Uh, you need to know when I first got to the Philippines, I had a lot to learn, like how to talk. I called Makati Makatai. I called Antipolo Antipolo. And I called Batangas Batangas. <laughs> so I had a lot to learn, right? Um, but I'm going to try. How do you like that? Um, I'm teachable. These three Americanos find out that this Filipino bartender stole their money, like $10,000 worth. And so they got some guns and went to the bar and cornered him and said, we know you took our money. You tell us where you hit it or we're going to shoot you. And so he goes, no English, no English. 
So they recruited another guy to help translate, and they, they said to him, you tell the bartender, tell us where he put the money. Tell us where he hid it, or we're going to shoot him. And so the translator turned to the bartender and conveyed these things in Tagalog, and the bartender replied like this, Tinago ko ang pera sa jeep ko, sa ilalim ng upuan, sa likod ng upuan ng driver, ito ay nakapark sa likod ng bar. Well, of course, the Americanos didn't know what he said, and so the translator turned to face them, and they said to the translator, what did he say? Where did he hide the money? What did he tell you? And the translator said, well, he said, I defy you, Americanos. I'm not telling you where the money is. Go ahead and shoot me. <laughs> Smart translator, huh? Guess who's walking away with the money in that story? Anyway, I got a kick out of that one. This morning, we want to talk about what it means to love like Jesus. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved us. You know, just as a disclaimer, if that's the right word, right up front, I want to say that when God challenges us to do something, he gives us the resources to do it. When God calls us to live a certain way, he doesn't expect us to do it in our own strength. He will, with us, live his life through us so that it works. And so when we're called to love as Christ loved us, isn't that a pretty tall order? It's like impossible. <laughs> no one can love like Jesus, but he calls us to love as God loved us. And so we imitate Jesus and trust in his Holy Spirit to give us the ability to be able to love like he loves, to be channels of his love, to, to allow him through cooperating with his Holy Spirit to love through us. That I want to be kind of an undercurrent of everything you hear because that takes away the excuses and gives us encouragement that, yes, I can be obedient in this regard. D.L. Moody says, said, the world does not understand theology or dogma, but it understands love and sympathy. We'll reach a whole lot more people by loving them than by arguing with them. Amen? And so love is so very, very important. We love like Jesus. So, the title of my message is, What's Love Got to Do With It? What's Love Got to Do, got to do With It? What's Love But a Sucking Hand? Okay, yeah, What's Love Got to Do With It? Sorry. Um, well, Tina Turner, everything. Love's got everything to do with it. Amen? John, the author of John and 1st, 2nd, 3rd John in Revelation, was fond of saying this expression, Love One Another. This is a command that I give to you that you love one another. And he would say it over and over again. And legend tells us that when he was leaving one of his churches in a farewell address, that's what he said. Brothers and sisters, I want you to love each other. To love one another. That's my command to you. And someone in the back said, Brother John, you said that to us a million times. How about a new commandment? And so he thought for a minute, stroked his beard, and he said, Okay, a new commandment I give unto you, that you love one another. <laughs> he was sort of caught up with that idea, and rightfully so. It's the great commandment. It's a new commandment. It, was always, it will always be appropriate. Love one another. Fifty-five times in the New Testament, we're told to love one another. To love like Jesus. To display radical love. Why? Well, as an answer to Tina Turner, what's love got to do with it? Everything. Love is everything. It's greater than speech. Paul says this in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, If I speak with the tongues of men and angels but do not have love, I become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Ralph Waldo Emerson said that love is our highest word, a synonym for God. You know, God is called a lot of things, but there is that verse that says God is love. It, it is very core who he is is love. And so in order for us to be what God wants us to be, we become like that through the power of the Holy Spirit. Paul says in Ephesians 4.15, I want you to speak the truth how? In love. Speak the truth in love. I was a youth pastor in my first ministry in the early 80s in Madison, Wisconsin. And 
at that time, the church I was part of in the beginning of my, my time there was having some real struggles. There were board members, a few of them, that were not very fond of the pastor, and they were constantly criticizing and saying things and causing problems, and, and um, it was rather distressing, etc. cetera. And, um, but I remember one night in particular, one of the board members, after saying some mean things to the pastor, I mean, stuff, if you were in a bar, you'd probably end up in a fight. I mean, it's just crazy. And he said some stuff, and then he said, now, I don't want you to misunderstand me. I just want to speak the truth. And I kind of sheepishly said, well, sir, there's more to that verse. It says, speak the truth in love. <laughs> How about trying that once or twice? And uh, that's what Paul says. Love is greater even than speech. Paul says in 1 Timothy 5.1, the goal of our instruction is love. We don't just pound people over the heads with the truth of the Bible. We do it in love. And so love is greater than speech. It's also greater than spirituality. Paul says, if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but do not have love, I am what? Nothing, nothing. I am nothing. Sigmund Freud said, love is the first requirement for mental health. And I agree with that. I think an insatiable self-focus is what oftentimes leads to mental instability. It's an outward focus that is most healthy. Love focuses on others. So I agree. It's a healthy thing to love others. Sometimes it might hurt, but in the long run, it's the best way to go. I love what D.L. Moody says about love. He said, he's dead. <laughs> he said, the churches would soon be filled to overflowing if outsiders would find that people in them love them when they came. Love draws people we must win them to us first by loving them, and then we win them to Christ. He said, I took up the word love in my studies, and I do not know how long it was before the passages began to rub off on me, and I began to love others. I had been feeding on love so long that it was, I was anxious to do everybody good I came in contact with. I, I got full of it. It ran out of my fingers. You take up the subject of love in the Bible, and it transforms you, he says. Then he says these interesting words. There is no use trying to do the, church, the work of the church without love. A doctor, a lawyer may do good work without love, but God's work cannot be done without love. And so when we love, we really make the impact that God wants us to make on the world around us. When we love with radical love like Jesus. Love is everything. It's greater than speech. It's greater than spirituality. It's greater than sacrifice. Paul says, if I give all my possessions to feed the poor and I surrender my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. It profits me nothing. Now, I'm Irish and proud of it, but Irish are sort of known for drinking too much, right? Have you heard that before? Like, uh, you'll never see an Irish lawyer. You know why? They can never pass a bar. <laughs> I just heard this joke. I love it. These, uh, these Irish were on a plane from Dublin to Boston, and the flight attendant, oh, they just love to sacrifice for their fellow men, uh, these Irish, let me tell you. So the flight attendant announces uh, to everyone in her wonderful Irish brogue, we're sorry to announce, but there are 103 passengers on this plane, and we only have 40 meals for the 10-hour flight. We apologize for this inconvenience. There was a serious mistake in the catering. Um, please forgive us. And so as a measure of good faith, because there's such a shortage of meals, we're going to offer free and unlimited beer, wine, and cocktails for all the passengers who sacrifice and do not get a meal. And everyone kind of clapped a little bit. Well, the flight went on. Two hours later, the flight attendant said, is anybody hungry? We still have 40 meals left on the plane. <laughs> I thought, those Irish, they love to sacrifice for their fellow citizens. I got a kick out of that one. Anyway, Vince, you really are crazy. Love is greater than sacrifice. You know what? Even non-believers 
give their lives for their cause. Obviously, we read about it in the paper all the time. I remember as a kid with horror watching live this Buddhist monk torch himself outside during the Vietnam War. Do you remember that, any of you that are old enough? But love is so important. Even sacrifice doesn't matter if we don't love. The Bible says if I don't love, no matter what I do, it doesn't profit me anything. Question, is there anything less than nothing? No. Love is everything. Life without love equals zero. It's greater than speech. It's greater than spirituality. It's greater than sacrifice. Love is excellent. Paul goes on to talk about love, calling it patient. Love is kind, is not jealous. It does not brag and is not arrogant. It's kind. I know my husband can be loving and kind, said the woman to her counselor. After all, he is to the dog. <laughs> How come we be, can be kind to dogs and pets and cars and toys and things, and yet so mean to each other, and many times so mean to those in our own family? And God says, don't do that. Love is kind. Love is not jealous and does not brag and is not arrogant. The word arrogant there is the picture of someone who belittles others, who puts down others, who kind of struts around like they own the world, and, and once in a while maybe they'll give themselves to these lower life forms around them. It's not a way to be, is it? Not arrogant. Someone has said, he who gets wrapped up in himself is a very small package indeed. Love is not like that. Love is not like this guy. You can't get close to this guy. We don't have these in the Philippines, but you know what a porcupine is. They're not very lovable. You can't get close. Why? Because they have these sticker things that come out of their bodies into your body, and they really hurt. They have thousands of them. They're a dreadful beast if you're not careful. This dog was not careful. He got a little too close to that porcupine. Any ideas what kind of dog that is? It's a pit bull. <laughs> it looks more like pitiful. Um, poor thing. Some people are like that. You just can't get close without getting hurt. And yet, we're still called to love. Amen? Love is patient. Long-suffering. Love is kind. The word long-suffering means enduring, tolerant, persevering. You don't give up. Not short-tempered. I have another confession to make. Years ago, when my eldest daughter was about two, we were in a car together, my wife and I and our daughter, and Kelly was in the car seat in the back, and all of a sudden she goes, Mommy, what's an idiot? <laughs> and she goes, she tried to explain, and she says, why do you ask that, Kelly? And she says, well, you never see any, but when Daddy drives, he sees a lot of them. <laughs> How do you say here in Tagalog? Hulika. I was busted. <laughs> That's not love. Love is what? Patient. Patient. It does not give up. Can you be patient with others? Maybe you can even be patient with yourself. God's still working in your life. Love does not give in. It patiently corrects. It's proactive. It listens. It transforms. It forgives. God's love is for us. God's patience is for us. His outrageous grace is for us. Love is, how do we say it? Patient. Remember Jonah? God says to Jonah, I want you to go from Israel over here to Nineveh. And Jonah says, uh-uh. And he goes that way to Tarshish. Instead of 500 miles away to the people of Assyria, he goes to Tarshish, 2,000 miles away, near Spain. I like this four-word outline that I found somewhere of the book of Jonah. Chapter 1, Jonah flees. Chapter 2, Jonah prays. Chapter 3, Jonah preaches. Chapter 4, Jonah pouts. I call him the porcupine preacher. God says, go to Nineveh. Now... I used to teach that chapter kind of like this. God says, go to Nineveh to preach to them that if they don't repent, they're going to be destroyed. 
and give them an opportunity to repent and be forgiven so that I don't have to discipline them, punish them. Well, Jonah says, no way. And he goes to Tarshish instead. And initially I was sort of, I would defend him and say, well, think about it. The Syrians were brutal. They destroyed Israel. They tortured people. They skinned them alive. They did horrible things. They were just savage. Why would you want to go there if you were an Israeli? You can hardly blame the guy, right? But then I studied chapter 4, and I'll get to that in a minute, and you could see that he, by his own admission, had a whole different reason for not going. It wasn't just because they were the enemy, and he was kind of afraid of them. It's a much worse uh, anti-motive, if you will. And so um, we'll, we'll see him as a bad example of radical love. But you know the story. He flees. He goes the other way. He gets tossed off a boat and swallowed by a fish. By the way, I, I, I like Jonah, know something about fish. You know that? When I was in Italy in August of last year um, for the birth of our first grandson, um, my son-in-law took me spear fishing, And they have the coolest spear guns there. So I decided I'm going to buy one and bring it back to the Philippines and go spear fishing. So I went to Barakai back in February, and I got my first fish. Woohoo! How do you like that? Don't be too impressed. <laughs> I don't even think we can make sushi out of that one. Anyway, well, Jonah knew something about fish, but it went the other way for him, as you know. He got swallowed by the fish, barfed up on the beach, preached the, the, the message to Nineveh, um, and they repented. I don't think his message went like this. God loves you, and I love you, and he has a wonderful plan for your life. It probably went more like, if you don't repent, patay nalang, you're going to die, and boy, will I be happy. So don't repent, but I'll preach anyway. You know, he wasn't really for them at all, but the Bible says they repented. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity, which he had declared he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Now, that should have been the end of the story. Happily ever after, super prophet Jonah, second chance God, but no. It greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He was not happy at all with what God had done. The heartless preacher, the porcupine prophet. You ever get angry when others are blessed? Or maybe jealous a little bit? Oh, Pastor Vince, thank the Lord. Someone gave me a brand new car. Isn't that wonderful? And then when we want to go, yes, it is. You know, <laughs> praise God. <laughs> Jonah didn't like the fact that God was gracious to these people. He wanted to deny them God's forgiveness and mercy. Love is not like that. Love is patient and kind. Love is excellent. It does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own, is not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. Love is not like that. I heard about a lady that went to the butcher shop. And, um, there were a number of people in line already, but she went right up to the counter in front of everybody and put her hand down on the counter and said, excuse me, sir, but I would like five pounds of dog food, please, as soon as you can. I'm really in a hurry. And then sort of inadvertently, she noticed the people she just cut in front of, and she kind of said, you could tell I'm in a hurry, right? And one guy said, oh, yeah, you're in a hurry. You're also pretty hungry, aren't you? <laughs> Get it, dog food? Oops. Well, he could probably learn about not taking into account a wrong suffered, but she could certainly learn about not seeking one's own. Love doesn't do that. Love doesn't keep a list, it says. Take into account a wrong suffered. Do we do that sometimes? We keep a list of stuff that people have done against us. Maybe it's mental, but it's logged in there, and we can bring it up anytime we want to. And God says, don't do that. Don't keep a list. Don't put, don't put people under what I'm calling an utang curse. <laughs> you owe me. I'm going to make you pay. I want to spend a little time here and try to suggest that love and forgiveness really go hand in hand. You know, God loved us so much he sent his son to make it possible for him to forgive us. And so love and forgiveness are very, very important partners in the Christian life as we choose to love radically, to love as Jesus loved. Peter Usinov says, love 
is an act of endless forgiveness. Ephesians 3, verses 17 and 18, the Apostle Paul says this, talking about love. He says, I want you to be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth of God's love, and to know the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled up with all the fullness of God. And so God wants us to know about, but also to, to experience his love um, so that we know that we are loved and so that then we can be a channel of that love to others as we allow Jesus to live his life through us. And certainly forgiveness is one of the primary and beautiful ways we show that. Rooted and grounded in love, deepening in our intimacy with Christ will have the effect of transforming us and conforming us with, into his character, which is love. And so as we stay connected to the Lord, love happens by God's grace miraculously in and through our lives. This family's going to need lots of love <laughs> and forgiveness. They painted the TV set. Look at that. What a riot. Now, let's look at some images of forgiveness. Pictures, word pictures. Forgiveness is a heartfelt decision to release the person who hurt you, removing obligation. Jesus says, for if you forgive men their transgressions, I will forgive yours, etc. But if you don't, you miss out on enjoying my forgiveness. You're not connected the way you should be. Forgiveness is not subtle blaming. <laughs> you ruined my life, but I forgive you. <laughs> Where's the emphasis in that challenge? It's not a small thing. It is a big deal. Some of you have people you need to forgive, and I'm not minimizing how difficult that can be, especially if they've done some things that really hurt you. You know, someone hurt us a few years ago, probably more than anyone in ministry for 35 years, not here in the U.S. It was really painful, and I struggled with forgiveness. And even just thinking about it again, things well up within me, and I got to re-forgive. You know what I'm saying? It's not easy. It's not a small thing. We need God's help. Forgiveness is not an endorsement. If you forgive someone, it's not the same as endorsing their misbehavior. It's good to remember that. Forgiveness is not the same as forgetting. God says, your sins and iniquities I will remember no more. It doesn't mean he forgets. It means he chooses not to deal with us on that basis anymore. Two old guys were talking, and one of them said, what do you want to have when you're older like we are now? <laughs> Parkinson's or Alzheimer's? And one old guy said, oh, Parkinson's. I'd rather just spill me drink than forget where I put it. <laughs> Well, there's some things we don't remember very well, but there's some things we do. And so forgetting means to forgive, to choose not to hold that against a person. Forgiveness does not always mean immediate restoration. Sometimes the relational part takes a little more time. I may have someone that's an employee of mine and they steal money from my company over time and I, I have to fire them. I still too have to forgive them, but I don't have to keep them working for me anymore. There may not be the same kind of restoration, although that is the ultimate goal, and that was God's goal in forgiveness, being restored in our relationship together. And you know what? Forgiveness doesn't have to be this slow and long process over a long period of time. It can be instantaneous because God can give us the strength to do it. So forgiveness is a decision in our heart to forgive removing the obligation or the burden or the barrier between us. Another picture is turning the key, opening the cell, and letting the prisoner walk free. In Jesus, in him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Redemption is a, is a prison kind of word. Slaves being set free because someone paid the price to let him go. And Jesus did that for us on the cross when he paid the price of his own blood, shedding his own blood to pay for our sins so that we could be set free from slavery to sin and Satan and able then to follow him. That's forgiveness. That's what Jesus did for us. And we love like Jesus. We forgive like Jesus. Forgive, another image, is to write across a debt in large letters. Nothing owed. Debt forgiven. And when you are dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us. And he has taken out of the way 
having nailed it to the cross. What a beautiful picture of what Jesus has done for us. This long list of the horrible things we've done and said, the long list of the sins that we've committed, the, the lines that we've crossed in our lives, and, and that list has been nailed to the cross, and it's gone, forgiven. No more debt. In fact, that's the very words of Jesus from the cross. It is finished. Tetelestai. The debt has been paid. And Jesus is the one who paid it so that he can write across our ledger nothing owed. Another image. To pound the gavel in the courtroom and declare someone not guilty like God did for us. Now let me skip ahead a little bit to the last phrase in this verse. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord will not take into account. I love that picture. God doesn't hold a ledger of our sins anymore. It's gone because of Jesus' work on the cross. He didn't keep a list and hold it against us and remind us of it all the time. Don't we sometimes do that with each other? And God says, I want you to forgive like Jesus. Let it go. Another image. To shoot an arrow so high and far it can never be found again. That's what Jesus has done with our sins. Who pardons how many? All our iniquities. Past, present, and future. Who heals all your diseases. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness toward those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. That's pretty far. Like infinitely far. That's how powerful... And deep is the forgiveness of Jesus Christ for us. What a picture. One more. God's forgiveness looks like bundling up the garbage and disposing of it, leaving the house clean and fresh. This unbelievable verse, 2 Corinthians 5.21, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. What a transfer. What a transaction. What an exchange. That is... When we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ, when we admit our sinfulness to God and believe that Jesus died for our sin on the cross, that he shed his blood to pay for our sins, a wonderful transfer make takes place. He, in effect, takes our sin away and imputes his righteousness to us. He writes that into our account. And we are declared to be as good as God, as good as Jesus, fit for heaven based on what Jesus Christ has done. So Jesus gets all the garbage dumped on him. And we get made clean. By his grace. What a wonderful, gracious, outrageous grace of our God that all of us know and desire to share with others. What did Jesus say? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is the same men that were spitting on him. You know, when I was a kid, you could do a lot. You could say stuff about me. You could make fun of my family. You can call me an idiot. You could say I'm ugly. But you spit on me. You know what I'm saying? That's like, that's it. You know what I'm saying? And Jesus took it. Just imagine that. Talk about disgraceful and shameful. He was beaten, pulverized beyond human recognition. And yet, he had the love in his heart to be able to say, Father, forgive them. Can you do it? No. I can't either. But he can. And he lives inside of you. And he can love through you as you cooperate with him by faith. Love, if you will, by faith. He's taken our sins away. What a great God. Here's a great picture of forgiveness. When the high priest finishes atoning for the holy place in the tent of meeting in the altar, he shall offer the live goat. Aaron shall lay both of his hands on the head of the live goat and confess over it all the iniquities of the sons of Israel and all their transgressions in regard to all their sins. And he shall lay them on the head of the goat and send it away into the wilderness by the hand of a man who stands in readiness. What a beautiful picture of forgiveness. Once a year on the Day of Atonement, the Israeli Holy Week, if you will, the high priest would, in one of his ceremonies, Name all the sins. And the idea was those sins are being transferred to the head of the goat. And then a strong man would take the goat in the wilderness, send it off running, never to be seen 
again as a powerful picture of what God does with our sins and his forgiveness. And truly, in the most remarkable and unbelievable way, Jesus is the scapegoat of all scapegoats as he took upon himself all our sins and took them away. Praise be to God for his wonderful grace and forgiveness. Nothing like it. There's nothing like the gospel of Jesus Christ. Forgiveness is deliberately choosing not to hold something against someone when an injury to the relationship has occurred. Choosing not to respond the way they deserve, but to give mercy instead. That's how we love like Jesus loves. You know, I read somewhere recently that there are those that believe that World War II came about because of bitterness over the end of World War I. And I believe that. You know, at the end of World War I, through a treaty that was established in Europe, basically Germany was crushed. Their economy tanked. Um, things went terrible. And many believe historians look back on it and say that uh, it was the Treaty of Versailles, I think, was way too harsh to the German people, as much as they deserved that for initiating World War I. And many people believe that Adolf Hitler was able to fuel that bitterness and able to work on that bitterness and causes people to rise up in revenge and anger against the rest of Europe that had done these terrible things to the German people. And, and as a result of World War I and the bitterness over that, the German people started World War II, and it's, it's quite conceivable. Bitterness is a huge and powerful thing. Unforgiveness is a huge and powerful thing. I believe it's often... Um, accelerated by demonic forces. It's a stronghold of the devil. In fact, one story I read was that Adolf Hitler was shunned, was, was spurned, was rejected by a Jewish girl when he was a young man. And, and it was that bitterness that fueled his hatred for the Jews later on. Don't let bitterness run the show in your life. It will run you into the ground and destroy so many around you. We need to be able to forgive by God's grace. So what if I don't forgive? Well, then I'm the one who's imprisoned, ultimately. Peter came and said to Jesus, Lord, how often shall I forgive my brother who sins against me? Seven times? And he thought he was really being generous here. Seven, the number of perfection. And Jesus said, no, 70 times seven. <laughs> now, was Jesus saying, after 490 times, pow, you can let him have it? No, he's basically saying, you don't stop. And then he tells a story about a king who forgives his servant a great debt. And the servant goes out to people that owe him money and puts him in prison. Doesn't even extend the same forgiveness that he received. And the king finds out. Says, what's this I hear? I forgave you that huge debt and you won't forgive the others? You go to prison. And there's a lot of stuff behind that story that Jesus is telling. But one certainly uh, is the case is that when we don't forgive, we put ourselves in bondage. And so in order to be free ourselves, we need to forgive. If I don't forgive, I give Satan an open door. Be angry and yet do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and do not give the devil an opportunity. Opportunity means, that literally is translated foothold. When we harbor anger and bitterness and unforgiveness in our heart, we give the devil an opportunity to be active in our lives, to put a foothold, to, to have a landing point in our hearts and minds. And we don't want to do that because he's very real. Now Paul says, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your anger. Now what he doesn't mean by that is, huh, don't go to bed mad. Stay up and fight. <laughs> That's not what he's saying. He's saying before you go to sleep, try and resolve it. I'll admit, there have been times I've been in a fight with my wife at night and we don't resolve it. I don't sleep good at all. Maybe that's one reason alone why you should resolve it. I take that literally. Before the sun goes down, before we go to bed, let's get this figured out so we can be reconciled. Otherwise, we give the devil a foothold, a loophole, a way in, and we don't want to do that. And it could also lead to bitterness, a tremendous stronghold of the enemy. The Bible says, Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for this day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Get rid of it because it will strangle you. It will render you immobile. It will not enable you to really reflect Jesus to those around you. 
It's a legendary story about Leonardo da Vinci when he was painting his famous painting, The Last Supper. At that particular time, he had an enemy who was another painter. He hated the guy. He despised him because of some things this man had done to him. And so da Vinci decided that when he would paint the face of Judas Iscariot in the Last Supper, he would use this guy's face <laughs> so that everyone who would ever look at that would know the story. Talk about revenge. Well, as he worked on the face of the other disciples, things went okay, but he just couldn't paint the face of Jesus, no matter how hard he tried. It just wouldn't work. And he got frustrated, and it was so hard, and finally he realized what was going on. He realized what was wrong. His hatred for the other painter was holding him back from finishing the face of Jesus. Only after making peace with his brother could he adequately paint the image of Christ. And I think there's a real good lesson there. When we hold bitterness and anger in our hearts toward a brother or sister or a family member, we can't reflect Jesus. It doesn't work. We can't paint the face of Jesus in our life until we make it right, until we forgive. So I encourage you, as hard as it is, trust Christ to work through you to make it work. One more reason or thing that happens to us, we certainly hinder our fellowship with God. Jesus says if you forgive men their, their transgressions, your Heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men, then your Father will not forgive you your transgressions. Now, how do I forgive? Well, I'm going to skip this so that you still like me, okay? And get out of here for lunch. I have self-esteem issues, you know. How do I forgive? We must seek God's resurrection power. Lord, I can't do it in my own strength. But your resurrection, your, your work on the cross and then your resurrection, you conquered sin. I can't do that, but you did. You conquered Satan. I can't do that, but you did. You conquered death. I can't do that, but you did. And so, Lord, will you inject, infuse, make um, applicable in my life your resurrection power so that I might forgive as you did? So we seek God's resurrection power. And then we can say like Paul, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. Now what Paul does not mean there is you can do anything you want and God will give you strength to do it. Proof. I can't sing, okay? And I dare not believe that verse applies to me getting up and singing a solo. Because that would be a real picture of what hell is like. You would not like that at all. You would all run away screaming, okay? That's not what it means. But it does mean that I can do what God calls me to do through what God gives me as strength in order to do it. We must seek God's resurrection power. How do I forgive? We must start over. Move toward rec reconciliation and love. Therefore, do not be afraid, said Joseph to his brothers. I will provide for you and your little ones. So he comforted them and spoke well of them. You know, remember the story of Joseph sold as a slave, uh, condemned as a rapist, thrown in prison, forgotten by the other prisoners, but then God elevates him to vice president of Egypt. He saves the nation. He saves his own people. His family is restored to him. Later his father dies, and at the end of all that, the brothers are like, okay, Joseph's going to get us now. He's going to exact his revenge, but Joseph doesn't. He says, what you did for, against me, you meant for evil. God meant it for good to bring about this wonderful result. I forgive you. Let's move forward. I'll provide for you and your little ones. Let's move forward. The past is past. Let's go ahead. I love that. I heard about a guy that was talking to his buddy, and he says, oh, man, when my wife gets mad at me, she gets historical. The guy said, what? You don't mean historical. You mean hysterical. And he goes, no, 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 she gets historical. She reminds me what I did last week and last month and last year and 10 years ago. Historical. So don't get historical. Or hysterical. <laughs> Forgive. Don't bring up the past. Move forward. Let's think about the future. Love does not keep a ledger, a list not to be forgotten. Love has a big eraser, not storing the list of wrongs against us. Love hits control, alt, delete in the relationship so you can start over. 
I heard about a woman who was in a doctor's office in the lounge and waiting for her appointment, and she had been diagnosed as having rabies. She had been bitten by a dog. And the nurse came out, and this woman's writing feverishly on a pad of paper, and the, lady, the nurse goes, ma'am, what are you doing? She goes, I'm making a list. The lady says, a list? A list of what? Of names. Names? What for? These are people I'm going to bite now that I know I have rabies. <laughs> love does not keep a list. It gets rid of it. I love what C.S. Lewis says. To be a Christian is to forgive the inexcusable because God has forgiven the inexcusable in you. Be forgiving. Keep a big cemetery behind your house. Use it to bury the faults of others. In Tagalog, you know what it is. Okay. <laughs> Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. Love is everything. Love is excellent. It's hand in hand with the truth. Bears all things believes all things, endures all things. It does not get bitter, irritable, or have bad temper. Galitza mundo, you know, people like that. Some people bring happiness wherever they go. Some, whenever they go. <laughs> Don't be those kind of people. I like what this one says. Speak when you are angry and you will make the best speech you will ever regret. Love is not like that. And finally, love is eternal. By the way, you know preacher code words, right? Finally means I still got more to say. I'm not quite done yet. Don't get too excited. You can't go to lunch just yet. I got a little more to say. That's what finally means. What you really need to listen for is lastly. That means a poem and a verse and you're out of here. Suffering's over, okay? So finally, uh, you've heard me say that before. I know. Love never fails. It will always be appropriate. If there are gifts of prophecy, they will be done away. Tongues, they will cease. Knowledge, it will be done away. But now abides faith, hope, love. These three, but the greatest is love. Why is love the greatest? Maybe because when we get to heaven, we won't need faith anymore. We'll be seeing Jesus face to face. We won't need hope anymore. Our hopes will be realized. But we can still love and be loved. It's eternal. It will always be the correct way to be. Love is the greatest. And so... John says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. The one who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And this is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us, and that he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another, to love as Jesus loved, to fervently love one another from the heart. I want to close with a video by Corey Ten Boom. And let me tell you, she nails it. Okay? You'll like this. Christ himself and his cross shows us that we can accept suffering as a part of God's plan for this world. When I was in a concentration camp, one of the most terrible things I had to go through was that they stripped us of all our clothing and we had to stand. The first time was the worst. I said, Betsy, I cannot bear this. And suddenly it was as if I saw Jesus at the cross. And the Bible tells, they took his garments, he hung there naked. And I knew he hung there for me, for my sins. 
And by my suffering, I understood a fraction of the suffering of Jesus Christ. And it made me so thankful that I could bear my suffering. Love, so amazing, so divine, demands my life, my soul, my all. Some people are afraid to look at the cross. Are you? Don't be afraid. The cross is terrible. It is terrible how Jesus suffered. Not to describe. But you must not be afraid to look at it. For if you had been the only person in the world, Jesus should have suffered for your sins. At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my sins rolled away, it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I have guidance every day. It was some time ago that I was in Berlin, and there came a man to me and said, Ah, Mr. Bohm, I am glad to see you. Don't you know me? And suddenly I saw that man that was one of the most cruel officers, guards, in the concentra in concentration camp. And that man said, I have, I'm now a Christian, I have found the Lord Jesus. I read my Bible and I know that there is forgiveness for all the sins of the whole world, also for my sins. I have forgiveness for the cruelties I have done. But then I have asked God grace for an opportunity that I could ask one of my very victims forgiveness. And Fräulein Tambom once in here forgiven. Will you forgive me? And I could not. I remembered the suffering of my dying sister through him. But when I saw, when I explained that I could not forgive, suddenly I knew I myself had no forgiveness. Do you know that Jesus has said that? When you do not forgive those who have sinned against you, my heavenly Father will not forgive you your sins. And I, I knew, oh, I'm not ready for Jesus coming because I have no forgiveness for my sins. But I was not able, I could not, I could only hate him. And then I took one of these beautiful texts, one of these boundless resources, Romans 5.5. 5. The love of God is shed abroad into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who is given to us. And I said, thank you, Jesus, that you have brought into my heart God's love through the Holy Spirit who is given to me. And thank you, Father, that your love is stronger than my hatred and unforgiveness. That same moment I was free. And I could say, brother, give me your hand. And I shook hands with him. And it was as if I felt God's love stream through my arms. You never touch so the ocean of God's love as that you forgive your enemies. Can you forgive? No. I can't either. But he can. Amen, huh? Isn't that great? Can you forgive? No. I can't either. But he can. Can you love like Jesus loves? No. I can't either. But he can. And so let's close in prayer. Would you stand with me and band come on up and let's ask Jesus to make this operational in our hearts by his grace. Amen? Lord Jesus, thank you for your grace and mercy and love and forgiveness. Will you use us as channels of these wonderful characteristics that you have shown so lavishly in our lives? 
Lord, enable us through resurrection power to love as you have loved, to forgive as we have been forgiven. And we claim by faith that this will work through your power, through your Holy Spirit, for your glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen.